Hello everyone, this video gives a glimpse into our research about modeling infrastructure deterioration on a large scale. So to begin, let's consider why it's important to model infrastructure deterioration in the first place. Well, for one, the well-being of many modern societies' economy is closely tied to the well-being of their infrastructure, such as roads and bridges, which connect people far away and facilitate the movement of goods and services. Now, the main issue is that there's just so much of infrastructure and that's so difficult to keep track of it all. So, and this issue is even further exacerbated when we're dealing with limited funds. And this is where modeling infrastructure deterioration comes in. It equips us with the knowledge about the current and future state of our infrastructure, which helps us make better plans and uh, better allocate our limited funds. So, uh, in this study, we're going to focus primarily on the transportation infrastructure consisting of bridges highlighted here in red and we're going to further restrict ourselves to the ones located in the Quebec province of Canada highlighted here. So to begin let's consider the data at our disposal. It primarily consists of visual inspections that are periodically performed which uh, assess the structural health. And in our case, these inspections are performed on an element level. So when we consider the bridges, these are uh, performed on the elements making up the bridges, such as the beams, pavement, guardrails, and so on. Now, to get an idea of how these uh, visual inspections look like, we can look at the graph here on the right of the condition on the y-axis over time on the x-axis. Now, in a perfect world, uh, inspections signifying gradual deterioration of a structural element would appear something like this. But we don't live in a perfect world, and in reality, there's much more variation like you see here. And this is because the inspections are subjective in nature. Two inspectors can look at the same thing and rate it differently. Now, another thing you may notice is that we have very few data points over a long period of time. And this is because inspections are costly in nature, resulting in very few, uh, resulting in, infrequent, uh, in them being carried out infrequently. Um, so this causes issues when working with this data. Now, or poses challenges, I should say. Now, another thing I'd like to highlight is that we're not dealing with 10, 20, or 100 or a few hundred structures, but rather in our case, for instance, we're dealing with tens of thousands of structures, each one made up of hundreds of different elements, resulting in over a million data points. So what this means is that efficiency is very important when modeling infrastructure deterioration at this scale. Now, another thing at our disposal is structural attributes, such as location, age, and material type. Now, uh, the idea here is that uh, there exists common deterioration pattern within our network of structures, and this information is encoded in these structural attributes. So, for instance, consider uh, structures located in the northern region of the Quebec province. These will deteriorate much differently than the ones located in the southern region, and this is because they're exposed to different environmental loads. Now, another thing you may consider is the age of the structure. Uh, much older bridges will deteriorate much faster compared to the ones that are just freshly built. All this to say that the main idea here is that there exist these common deterioration patterns within our network of structures, and this information basically is embedded in these structural attributes, which we would like to leverage. Now, previously, our group uh, developed a model that takes uh, these two sources of data uh, into consideration, and it consisted of a state-space model that uh, used uh, the visual inspections to model deterioration and a kernel regression component that basically improved the predictions made by the state-space model by uh, leveraging this uh, information uh, of the, from the structural attributes. Now, the main advantages of this model were that it was probabilistic and capable of quantifying the uh, uncertainty associated with the observations, the visual inspections, and relating this uh, uncertainty to the inspectors, each individual inspector that performed. So resulting basically in a unique estimate for the uncertainty of each individual inspector. Now the main drawbacks of this model are that it is quite slow and restricted to using very few structural attributes. Now in this work, we hope to, uh, we aim to address these limitations so uh, since this work builds on this existing model, we're just going to take a quick look on uh, how it works. Just a brief overview. So here we have a graph uh, of a state on the y-axis over uh, time on the x-axis. The blue points here represent uh, visual inspections made on this synthetic element. And uh, the red dashed line represents the, the true state of this element. And since this is synthetic data, we have access to the true state. 
So the way a state-space model works, it's uh, basically it's a probabilistic method that consists of, uh, consists of two models, a transition model shown here in the green and an observation model shown here in the red. Now through the transition model, we basically define the system dynamics. And in our case, this is the physical deterioration process that we define using simple kinematics. Now the observation model basically factors in the visual inspection process and in here uh, the the uh, the error component VT through that we basically uh, I model the error associated with the observations and we relate that to the each individual inspector. The way we model it is using a normal distribution with a certain mean value and standard uh, deviation. Now the mean value basically captures the relative tendency of an inspector to overestimate or underestimate the structure and uh, the, uh, the condition of a structure and the standard deviation basically uh, characterizes the variation of the given inspector's uh, observation. Now, uh, the, the beauty of this method is that we can actually get a unique estimate for each individual inspector using all of the using their observations uh, on our network of structures. So, uh, the way the state space model works, basically we define some prior knowledge. It's a Bayesian method, so we define some prior knowledge about our um, the, the the state. And we propagate this forward using the transition model. Uh, so if there exists an observation at any time step, we update our predictions made by the transition model by factoring in the observation and the prediction made by the transition model. If there are an observation, we simply carry out uh, predictions by the transition model until a predefined time, time frame. So uh, this is the forward propagation of our knowledge. We retrospectively update this by smoothening our predictions and uh, resulting in a nice smooth uh, deterioration curve. Now, since we have very few data points, I'd just like to emphasize that it's very important to uh, adequately define the, the prior knowledge that we, that we carry forward. And to demonstrate this, we're just gonna show how um, uh, sensitive is uh, the, the final predictions on the, def on the initial deterioration rate. And you can see that even small shifts in the deterioration rate cause quite a huge uh, deviation from the true state shown in the red. And uh, in the existing method, this is uh, taken care of or defining the initial deterioration rate is done by the kernel regression component, by lever which, which leverages the structural attribute information. Now, as we previously mentioned, unfortunately, this model does suffer from some drawbacks that uh, mainly arise from the kernel regression component. So, so, for instance, it can only consider a limited number of structural attributes. So what does this mean? If we have a full set of structural attributes that you can see here, since we're limited to a few, we have to go and test out different combinations of these attributes until we find the best one and then use that set or subset in our final model to predict, give us our prior knowledge for the deterioration which we propagate uh, forward. Now, uh, even with the using very few structural attributes that you can see here, the model is also inherently slow and requires a lot of computational resources, uh, resulting in over hundreds of uh, hours of GPU calculations. And this time doesn't even include uh, the time spent finding the optimal subset of the structural attributes. Now, uh, on top of this, uh, there's a it's, the model is not quite straightforward to use, so it does require some expert knowledge in order to configure it so in order to make it work, which all these limitations basically limit the practicality of uh, this existing method. Now, although there's uh, all these limitations, it's not quite a straightforward, uh, simple problem that we're trying to, to solve in the regression problem. Uh, we're not simply learning uh, a given deterioration rate as a function of the structural attributes because we actually don't have access to this deterioration rate in the first place. We, it's a latent variable which we infer from limited visual inspection data. So how do we do that? We uh, initially we define the prior. So the main goal is to our objective is to define the prior, right? The prior initial deterioration rate as a function of the structural attributes. But since we don't know this, in, uh, this we don't have access to this initially. We define the prior without using the structural attributes, we propagate, we only have basically access to the observations made on the condition state 
of the of the structures. So what we do is we define a prior without structural attributes and we propagate this knowledge forward. We retrospectively update this by smoothing, ending up with the smoothed estimates of the condition, deterioration rate, and the deterioration acceleration. So what we do is we end up we we take the initial deterioration rate and we use that uh, basically to train our regression model. Okay, and once we, we have like an initial estimate of the regression model, of its parameters, we uh, basically use that uh, the relation that we learn, even though it's limited, to define the prior, and then again, repeat the process. We propagate that forward, retrospectively update it, we get the initial estimates, we use these, uh, uh, and then we take the initial speed estimate and train the model. We kind of do this uh, recursively, until we have a very uh, until a predefined threshold is met, is met basically this is just a, a brief overview for the full details i encourage you to read the the manuscript that is linked in the in the description okay so <clears throat> the way we propose to address uh, or address this or meet overcome these challenges is through replacing the kernel regression component with the Bayesian neural network. Now, what are Bayesian neural networks? It's simply standard neural networks that employ Bayesian inference principles. So, as you can see here, there's a standard for feed for all neural network consisting of an input layer, hidden layers, and output layers. And these are interconnected in, uh, by a matrix vector addition and multiplication. Now, in our case, we rely on the recently developed uh, inference method that is efficient and uh, capable of uh, making the inference in closed form, making it, which makes it quite fast. And it's called TGI, which is stands for Tractable Approximate Gaussian Inference. Now, the way it works, basically, it's a, in essence, it's a, it treats the parameters of the uh, uh, of the neural network as a Gaussian random variables, and it makes some other approximations which allow it to basically use the uh, closed form equations of the Gaussian conditions in order to learn the parameters and make the inference. Now what this allows us to do is uh, again like I mentioned closed form inference making it very fast. It also allows us to capture the uncertainty that is inherent to the uh, phenomena that we're modeling known as aleatory uncertainty and it, uh, in compared to the, its uh, gradient counterparts that um, counterparts that rely on gradient uh, optimization, it contains virtually no hyperparameters. So before we continue any further, I'd like to concretely restate the research objectives. Now, our main goal is to model, to probabilistically model infrastructure deterioration on a very large scale. We'd like to factor in all of the structural attribute information in our model and not leaving anything on the table. Now, if we meet this two criteria, we'd also like to model, uh, uh, make use of all of the data at our disposal. So the, the existing method right now, given that it's computation, given its computation demands, it's only capable of modeling each individual category separately. So it models beam separately, pavement separately, and so on. What we'd like to do is enable joint processing of all of these data together. Now, uh, would like and how we'd like to do this is by replacing the kernel regression component with the Bayesian neural network that employs the tractable approximate Gaussian inference method. So here is a brief overview of how a final model looks like. So once it's fully trained and ready to go. So here we have a bunch of elements that make up our Struct, uh, network that make up our bridges, which make up our network of structures. Each of these have a unique set of attributes, structural attributes such as location, age, and so on. This information gets passed to our trained Bayesian neural network, which predicts the prior knowledge for our deterioration rate. So we have basically a distribution uh, over this a value. And uh, we basically use this for this given element to define the prior, which we propagate forward just the prior for the deterioration rate. We pass our observation and this prior into our state space model and we propagate this knowledge forward, which we rep rep retrospectively update using uh, by smoothing it, ending up with these uh, estimates, final estimates of the deterioration condition, deterioration rate, and the deterioration acceleration. This is just a brief overview of how the model works. 
For the full details, I encourage you to read the manuscript. Now, the main advantages of this model is that the regression component now relies on analytical inference, uh, making the computation really, really fast. Now, uh, another thing it uh, brings is that uh, we're no longer restricted to fusing few structural attributes. We feed all of them into our model and basically let it learn which ones are important. And it basically afterwards, it defines the initial deterioration rate, which we use to define our initial state that we propagate forward in time. Finally, in comparison to its predecessor, the model is much more uh, easier to use. Uh, basically a plug and play solution, making it quite appealing for, um, for a widespread application. So let's, let's, let's consider some results of the proposed model. So here we're just going to look at the results on a single synthetic element. Uh, on the left we have a graph of its condition over time and on the right we have the graph of its deterioration speed rate over time. Now here the blue points represent the uh, inspections performed on the synthetic element by different inspectors and these error bars basically represent the uncertainty associated with each inspector that we estimate using uh, their full range of, of their data on all of the synthetic uh, elements making up our network of structure. So here we have the predictions made by our model shown at the dashed red line with the shaded area representing uh, the uncertainty. And we can see that the inspection points align quite well with our predictions on the condition graph. Now, since this is a synthetic element, we also have access to the true state shown here at the dashed red line. And we also see that the true state falls within stand two standard deviations of both the predicted condition and the predicted deterioration rate. Now, this was just for a single synthetic element. We'd like to consider the performance on the network scale as well. And to do that, we basically randomly select 500 elements from our network of uh, synth uh, synthetic structures. And we basically compare how well our model predicts the initial deterioration uh, uh, rate uh, compared to the true initial deterioration rate that we have access to. So uh, to do that, here we consider this uh, graph on the right where we have the prediction on the y-axis and the the true speed on the on the x-axis. So we can see here the predictions made by the existing method shown in the blue and the proposed method shown in magenta. And we can see that both methods actually do quite a good job of uh, predicting uh, this initial this quantity. Uh, and given that uh, the both scatter plots align well with the diagonal, you can see that the existing method has a little bit of a tighter spread. Although it's a little bit biased, and in contrast, the proposed method has a little bit more of a spread, but it's uh, but it's equally spread compared to the standard deviation, so it's less biased. Now, this is just for this is for synthetic uh, elements. We'd also like to consider the performance on the real elements. So here we have uh, inspections made on a, uh, basically a of of a beam element taken from a bridge from our network of structures in the Quebec province that we're considering in the study. Uh, on the left, again, we have the graph of the condition, and on the right, we have the graph of the deterioration rate. The blue points, again, represent the inspections made on this uh, real element, with the error bars representing the uncertainty of each individual inspector that we estimate using the full their full range of inspections on the whole network of structures. So here we have the predictions made by our uh, model shown in the uh, blah, black dashed line with the error uh, with the uncertainty represented by the shaded area and we can see that again uh, these predictions align quite well with the given uh, inspection data so this is just again for a single uh, beam element we'd like to see how well it performs on a network scale so to do that we go back to our data set consisting of 10,000 uh, bridges, and we isolate a small fraction of this and put that aside to be used as a test set to, gain, to gain the, uh, gauge the performance of our model. And uh, just to, given the, since we're doing a comparison with the, with the existing method, which is limited in its uh, uh, computational capacity, we're only considering the beam elements uh, in this case. So the performance metrics we use are the log likelihood and training time. And we can see that the proposed method here uh, achieves a slightly better log likelihood, but a significantly, uh, at a significantly less training time. In fact, it is nearly two orders of magnitude faster 
than the existing method while achieving a slightly better uh, log likelihood. Now, with these computational gains, the proposed model is no longer restricted to using uh, or processing individual structure, structural categories separately as the existing method. Uh, with the computational gains that we, we obtain with the proposed method, we can actually process all of the structural category uh, simultaneously, so use basically the full range of observations of each individual inspector. What this allows us, or what this, the benefits that this brings is that we have consistent observation estimate for the inspectors across different structural categories, which uh, which, which is more intuitive. Uh, what this basically means is that you would uh, mm, expect an inspector performing, uh, you would expect an inspector to have the same error, uh, irrespective of their uh, whether they're performing observations on beam elements or pavement elements, right? Another thing it does is it allows us to uh, estimate these, uh, this uncertainty of each individual inspector using all of their observations, which means uh, in the cases where the inspector has only, say, five observations on a given structural category, compared, uh, which would lead to a poor estimate compared to, say, uh, hundreds or thousands of observations if we consider their observa if the inspections on the full range of structural categories. So intuitively, we would expect this to lead to using more data to lead to much better estimates of this uncertainty. So um, <clears throat> first we'd like to just examine how these uh, uh, inspector, the estimates of the, our inspectors uh, parameters change when we go from a single structural category compared to when we uh, use the observation on the all structural categories. So if you recall that uh, we model the uh, uncertainty of each inspector using a normal distribution with a given mean and standard deviation with the mean measuring basically the relative tendency of the inspector to overestimate or underestimate a structural condition and the standard deviation measuring uh, the variability of these um, observations. So what does hap what happens with uh, these uh, estimates? We'd, we would like to explore that. So here on the left we have the relative biases of the inspectors uh, when we consider all of the structural categories compared to when we consider uh, their observations on the beams only. And here on the right, we have the estimates for the uh, observations for the for the standard deviations. So here we can see that, uh, based on these scatter plots, that the relative biases actually don't change very much in contrast to the standard deviations. And um, one reason might be because when the, we consider all of the observations of a given inspector, uh, on the network of structure, it's more likely that there is much more uh, variation, which would indicate this shift uh, towards uh, higher estimates for the standard deviations when we're considering all of the structural categories, their observations on all of the structural categories compared to their observations just on the beam elements only. Now, this was just a visual expl ex explanatory look on how uh, these uh, inspector parameters estimates change we'd like to also explore the impact on the actual performance. And to do that, we basically measure the, we basically have two models. One model uh, trained on five structural categories individually, rather five models trained on five structural categories individually, and one model trained on all of, using the observations on all of these structural categories at the same time. So here we have basically the performance on the validation set on, on in these in these columns, and here we have the performance on the test set in these columns on the right. So the left column uh, is the performance for uh, the model trained using the observations of each individual category independently, and the this column is basically for uh, the models trained using the full um, the full range of observations on all five categories at the same time. So we can see that the model that was trained on all five categories outperforms the one that is trained on uh, each category independently in three out of five times on the validation set and four out of five times on the test set. And what this indicates is that the estimates for the parameters or inspectors parameters uh, that uh, use their full range of observations lead to better performance since it outperformed the uh, uh, model trained independently on each category in 7 out of 10 times. 
So to conclude, in this work, we developed a probabilistic infrastructure deterioration model that is scalable to large networks of structures while integrating all of the structural attribute information into the model, not leaving anything on the table. We also showed that the proposed model, when compared to the existing method, offers huge computational gains, reducing the training time from more than 30 days to merely four days when considering the entire network of structures. Now, these benefits also allowed us to automate the training of the, of the model on the entire network of structures, as well as use more of the data to estimate some of the uh, model parameters. Now, all of this work is uh, integrated into the uh, OpenIPDM package that is available on GitHub. Uh, to find it, simply search OpenIPDM and you should be able uh, to, to uh, get access to the, to the full range of code that was uh, used in this work. So thank you very much for your attention and I hope you find this useful.